So welcome everyone. The topic for uh, the afternoon is sustainable development. Uh, I am pretty sure that uh, many of the teachers are already familiar with this topic, but I am going to share uh, some ideas about sustainable development that maybe some of them you might be familiar with and some of them may be new to you. So uh, I, I will give a, a brief uh, introduction about the, the basic uh, concepts, uh, but uh, I, I expect that the, uh, the teachers will have uh, already done that or if they have not done it that they will do it on their own. So this is the outline of the talk and uh, this, uh, is, this topic is going to span uh, two sessions. So I will, I will stop somewhere over here for a break uh, and then we will continue in the second session. So uh, I would like to uh, begin from uh, uh, the very basics where we, uh, when we study the topic on biogeochemical cycles, uh, we, we look at the various uh, segments of the environment and then we study all the biogeochemical cycles like the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle and things like that. Uh, these cycles give us a sense that all these segments, uh, the atmosphere, the lithosphere, uh, the biosphere and the hydrosphere that they are interacting with each other. So there are interactions within each segment and then there are interactions uh, between segments uh, and it is these uh, these interactions all put together which we call as uh, the biosphere in, 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 the, in the broader sense. Uh, the biosphere has a narrow sense in which it talks about only living organisms, uh, but in the broader sense it includes um, all that supports life as well. So um, the, uh, the biosphere which, is, which has so much of diversity and there is a topic in, uh, in this course uh, called biodiversity. So uh, all that put together, what does it mean to us? Uh, many of us are probably engineers and uh, we do not have a very good sense of uh, what really that uh, biodiversity and all these interactions actually mean to us or, or how do they benefit us. So um, um, I think people who have uh, already taught this course are very well aware uh, that uh, it is extremely important for us because all that we get, all the ecosystem uh, services that we get from nature, including the fresh air, the water, the soil and the food and everything that we get from nature actually depends on these interactions. So these interactions in some sense are, are, are working in a coordinated fashion to enable us to uh, lead our lives. So they are, they are benefiting us. Uh, now, um, although we generally understand this, uh, we, uh, we probably do not quite uh, well um, connect how our actions in one area affect uh, something in nature which apparently is very distant. So in order to emphasize uh, this point, uh, I would I'd, uh, I'd like to show you this short video, it is only a 5 minute video uh, where um, uh, you see how the reintroduction of one species of animals which is uh, the wolf uh, in the Yellowstone National Park led to profound changes not only in the, uh, in the biological community over there, but in fact even in the way uh, the, the, the rivers ran. So the rivers basically altered their courses, um, uh, the, the whole topography uh, had a, a great impact by the reintroduction of the species. Um, just a single species, the wolf. So the wolf was there in Yellowstone National Park before, but un, uh, it got hunted down um, and then it was reintroduced. So that reintroduction actually had a cascade of uh, beneficial effects. Uh, so uh, let us let's see this uh, through this uh, very nice video. So was not that a fantastic video? I mean it is in 5 minutes it communicates such a profound idea that the, the ecosystem is actually the ecosystem and the, the biosphere altogether is actually uh, working so hard to, to create these life friendly conditions for us. And uh, that is that's exactly uh, what uh, James Lovelock um, uh, observed when he, um, he was an at atmospheric scientist, he worked with NASA and he um, he actually tried to study the atmospheres of planets and through that to infer whether life existed on those planets or not. And, and he figured that uh, 
com in contrast with other planets, the Earth has an, an atmospheric chemistry which is very unusual. And uh, he, according to his uh, study, he found that it was life that was creating these conditions which are very suitable for life. In, in other words, uh, the, the plants, the green plants, uh, they absorbed carbon dioxide and they gave out oxygen. That is why we have 20 percent uh, oxygen in the atmosphere which is what leads to life as we know it today. So uh, looking merely at the atmosphere, one infers that the earth must have life which is actually uh, doing all this. So uh, the, he, he, he uh, had a theory and he called it uh, the Gaia theory which was inspired by the uh, Greek earth goddess Gaia. In, in India we have a, a similar concept of the earth goddess, our Bhuma Devi, Bhu Devi. Uh, so uh, the, the concept was that the earth with all its intricate and interacting systems uh, behaves as if it were a super organism. So it is not to say that the earth actually is a super organism, but it does behave as if it were a super organism. And um, uh, the, the, so, so what, are, what, what is this behavior like a super organism that we are talking about? It is the, uh, the interaction between various parts to constitute a whole. So the earth actually behaves as if it is a whole and uh, it has self-regulation. It can, if there is a disturbance, it can correct the disturbance. For instance, uh, all of you are probably sitting in some uh, seminar hall or some, some computer uh, lab, so which probably has fans or air, air conditioners. So supposing I turn off the air conditioner, what happens? So your body heats up. So when your body heats up, so I am creating a disturbance. I am creating a disturbance by allowing your body temperature to rise. So how does your, since you are an organism uh, and not an inert uh, object, uh, you can correct that situation. The high temperature is not good for you. Uh, and hence the body responds by sweating. So it corrects uh, this disturbance. So the earth also due to the, uh, which is obvious in the chemistry of the oceans, the atmospheric chemistry and so many other uh, systems that we see in the earth, that the earth is able to self-regulate, which is a, a characteristic similar to life. And that is why he says that the earth uh, appears as if it is a, a super organism. So uh, if, we, if we actually uh, accept this theory, um, it, it actually opens up a, 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 new, a new perspective towards looking at nature. So we, we start to see nature as something that is beneficial for us, as something that supports us and without which we are nowhere. So uh, it, can, it can actually be the foundation of the uh, conservation movement, which it has in many ways. Okay. So, um, uh, although the biosphere is so beautiful and nature supports us and nature supports life and nature is full of bi biodiversity, what we find is that um, presently our world is plagued with a number of environmental problems. And the list is very long, I have mentioned a few over there. Uh, they are like global warming, ozone depletion, deforestation, desertification, loss of biodiversity and so many more. Okay? So all these really serious problems, so serious that in fact some scientists believe that you know we could be heading for a, a near collapse uh, of the biosphere. So uh, we are faced with so many problems while we have achieved great progress in technology. So the technology and the progress and everything is good but it has come at a very big cost. Now how much exactly is our impact on nature, how, how, do, we, how do we estimate that? Uh, of, of course, we would like to have, we would like to put numbers on it. We, we would like to understand it in uh, some quantitative way. So uh, the ecological footprint is uh, an estimate or is an approach to try to estimate our impacts on the environment. And um, the, the, the logic is, is thus that we, uh, many of our activities tend to harm nature or, or harm the environment. But the environment, as I told you, it, it can self-regulate, it can regenerate or restore some of the damage that we do. So how much area would one person or a family or a city or the entire world would require in order to restore the impacts that they have on the environment? 
So it is the ecological footprint is the amount of biologically productive land and sea area needed to supply the resources that a human population consumes and to assimilate the associated waste and damage. So it is, uh, as I said, it is reported in uh, area units or it can be uh, uh, reported in, uh, in terms of the, uh, in, in multiples of the uh, biological capacity of the earth. So when you say that uh, the, uh, the uh, ecological footprint of humanity is, uh, it turns out that presently it is more than one earth. Uh, it means that we are consuming more than what the, uh, what the environment can regenerate. So this shows uh, how at present we are consuming resources much faster than they can be regenerated. As a result, we are, uh, our ecological footprint is 1.5 times the area of the earth. So in other, other words, we have exceeded the uh, earth's regenerative capacity by 50%. And if the current trend of development continues unabated, in by, by 2050, we may need nearly three Earths. But we know that that is not possible because we have only one Earth. Um, so we need to take some steps to actually reduce our ecological footprint and go along this trajectory so that by 2050, we would actually be uh, requiring only the resources of one earth. So uh, workshop coordinators uh, meet that we had in April, I had asked this question, if we have only one earth, how can we consume more than that? So in other words, if you, if you have only 100 rupees, how can you consume 150 rupees? So the, the answer to that actually is uh, that we are, we are consuming not only the renewable resources which are, which are restored, but we are consuming even the non-renewable resources or we are consuming renewable resources beyond their renewable capacity. So there is going to be a depletion. There, is, there are reserves of uh, resources, but we cannot consume all of that. So uh, an example would be, uh, let us say you have a mango tree. You can only pluck the mangoes. If you start uh, pl plucking all the leaves, then you are, uh, you are eating into tomorrow's productivity. So uh, th that is the point. So as a result, we find that presently we have an ecological footprint that exceeds uh, the area of the earth. Now, uh, the funny thing and uh, it is more than a coincidence that uh, while we are having this um, environmental uh, problem, the, the list of environmental problems that I showed you which all come together as an, an increased uh, ecological footprint, we also simultaneously have a social crisis. So we have on, on various continents, we have wars, we have terrorism, we within, within uh, our country and in many other countries, we have tremendous corruption and uh, so many other social problems. We have poverty, the basic needs of many people have not been met. There are something like uh, 800 million odd people who are starving. So in this world with so much technology, we can go to the moon, we are thinking of colonizing Mars, uh, but we have not succeeded in feeding everybody. Um, at the individual level also we see that there are so many problems, there are health problems, uh, there are uh, other lifestyle related problems that are there. So is it, is it merely a coincidence that while we have so many environmental problems that we also have a number of social problems. So is it likely that the, the environmental crisis and the social crisis are related? I, I, will, I will put that question to you, we will we'll try to answer it or we will try to um, touch upon some issues related to this possible connection towards the end of the presentation. But all in all, uh, development which actually aims for at the, at the basic level which aims at the survival of the human race and at, at higher levels it aims at prosperity of humanity has now actually uh, is now at a point where it can, some people believe uh, is even threatening our existence uh, in the future. So uh, is this the kind of uh, development that we want or do we need to take some corrective measures? Uh, 
Uh, in fact, if there were no need of uh, taking any corrective measures, we would probably not be having this course. So the unsustainability that we see, the unsustainability has uh, two dimensions, the environmental crisis as well as the social crisis. And all this put together uh, is, uh, is what I, I would be using as unsustainability. The term unsustainability, whenever I use it throughout my presentation, I mean both the environmental and the social dimensions of it. So this has been um, understood to be um, a, a, something called as the tragedy of the commons. So this person, an economist, Garrett Hardin, um, sometime in the 60s, uh, had this uh, theory of uh, the tragedy of the commons where he uh, gave an example of a grassland which is a common, it is an open access resource uh, which belongs to the entire village and people can have their cows uh, graze on that. They do not have to pay any tax and it is not regulated in any manner. So when the common resource is shared by individuals who are rational, who are intelligent, who understand economics um, and there is no regulation of any kind then it inevitably uh, degenerates the resource because people put in more and more cows so that they can get more and more benefit out of it. So each cow that you put in yields milk. The, the milk is privately enjoyed. The depletion of the resource, which is the consumption of the grass, is commonly shared by everybody. So when the damage is commonly shared, distributed, and when the uh, benefits are privately enjoyed, each person is tempted to put more and more cows on the grassland. And uh, when, when such a thing happens, the, the grassland ultimately uh, gets destroyed. Now there is a, a slight uh, correction over here. The, the word commons as used by Hardin is probably not the best term because the commons uh, is now uh, better understood to be uh, regulated commons. So, so uh, Commons are uh, common resources which are regulated by the public by mutual agreement. Uh, whereas uh, the, the, in the sense that Hardin used it, it is an open access resource. So nevertheless, many resources in nature today are open access and people are not controlling themselves, which is leading to this uh, tragic situation. The, the tragedy is basically the de de degradation of that resource. So, we, we just understood the, the nature of uh, the problem that we are facing and we obviously are not happy with that. We do not want development to harm us, we want development to, to yield prosperity to mankind. So we need to solve this problem and how do we solve it? So we need a new model of development which does not emphasize merely on economic uh, prosperity but it also balances the other two factors which are very important to us, which is society and the environment. So while we said that uh, economic development is happening at the expense of society and at the expense of the environment, we need to balance it and we, uh, we should aim for economic development that meets the needs of the present while preserving the environment so that it does not hamper the, uh, uh, the ability of future generations to meet their uh, requirements. So it is, uh, it is quite obvious that you cannot have too much of inequality in society. That is, that is not going to be stable. Uh, it, is, it is not going to be uh, in line with this paradigm of sustainable development. And we cannot damage the environment. We can, we can use the renewable resources, but the non-renewable resources by definition, they cannot be renewed and therefore uh, they are going to get exhausted. There, is going, there are going to be impacts. So if we, if we understand this basic concept, then we, we, are, we are in the game. Otherwise, no matter what we do, uh, you know, we cannot stop this uh, problem of unsustainability. So uh, these three pillars, society, economy and environment, they are called as the three interdependent and mutually reinforcing pillars of sustainable development. Interdependent because you cannot achieve one without the other two. How can you achieve economic prosperity if, if there is uh, social injustice to, to an extreme extent, then it will simply not last. And for any economic process, uh, the environment is the ultimate resource, you know. So uh, if the environment is degraded, then you cannot get economic development. So they are interdependent and they are mutually reinforcing because if you, if you do it right, 
uh, you will you will be able to get all of them. So if you are uh, if you have the correct policies, if your um, uh, if your economic development is on solid ground, then it will naturally uh, lead to social justice as well as uh, environmental protection. Okay, so uh, it's okay to say that uh, we need sustainability, but how do we actually bring about sustainability? So I want you to uh, pause a little over here and uh, maybe in your notebook just write down maybe four or five points if you can write ten that will be good. So if you can write about five to ten points on what you think should be done to bring about sustainability, sustainable development. I, I think do we have do we have agreement on uh, the need for sustainability? I, I hope everybody is in agreement with that. So if you are in agreement with that, I want you to note down a few points as to what you would do if you were uh, a policy maker, what would you do in order to make that happen. Okay, so what I had told you uh, as an exercise was to list down a few things that you would, uh, you would uh, want to be done uh, in order to bring about sustainability. Uh, I think uh, most of you might have done, we did not actually get a chance to uh, probe how many people have noted down and things like that. But I am normally when I teach in my class and I ask the students to do this very same exercise, uh, they come up with a long list and uh, I have kind of put together that list which I usually see in my classes and that looks something like this. There are many more, I, I have just represented a few over there. So something like um, you know stop deforestation, replace fossil fuels with renewable energy, uh, reduce recycle reuse, how many are familiar with this? Uh, with these three R's, reduce, recycle, reuse in the context of waste management. I think that is pretty, uh, pretty common. Uh, protect wildlife and habitats which was one of the questions that we got. So all these things and, and then there are some, some other things which are on the social side of it, uh, something like remove poverty and hunger because unless you remove poverty, uh, people will be uh, forced to turn towards. Uh, uh, deforestation and, and damaging the environment. If everybody is well fed, then nobody is uh, going to uh, go on damaging nature. So, so many things uh, actually come up uh, to our minds. So, all these are very good ideas. Um, there is, um, these are all very well meaning uh, approaches that many people take and there are, there are whole organizations that are uh, non-governmental organizations, there are very committed individuals which are working in each of these areas. So I am not, I'm not saying that what they are doing is uh, anything uh, less, uh, but I, I merely would like to submit uh, that if we pursue all these uh, activities, no matter how good they are, the outcome is not likely to be sustainability. We are not likely to achieve sustainability, no matter how good these ideas are. And, and why do I say that? The reason I am saying that is uh, will be obvious in the in the following discussion. So I am going to say that uh, the fragmented approach of pursuing each of these good th activities uh, in a disconnected fashion is inadequate. It is not going to uh, be sufficient for achieving sustainability. And the reason uh, I am going to tell you is that we uh, the, the environment, this is the egg, egg model okay, or uh, I have kind of adapted it a little bit. Um, so uh, the, the environment is the, is the entire, is the super set in which we all live. And uh, within that we have the yellow, uh, uh, the uh, yellow ellipse which is human society. And within that we have various organizations, various institutions like the uh, government, our cultural organizations and things like that, the economy. And these various problems that we saw, the environmental uh, problems and then the social problems that we all saw, they, they, ha they overlap, you know, they overlap between the environment and society. There are some environmental aspects to the food crisis, there are some social aspects to the food crisis. But I want you to pay attention to these arrows over here. The arrows tell you that the food crisis is not only related to itself, but it is related to the water crisis. It is related to uh, the economy, it is related to governmental policies. 
So there are these interactions that are there in within nature, see within the environment also we saw that there are interactions between various segments. So within society, within various organizations there are interactions. So the problems that we face also interact with other problems and, and other institutions. So it is because of this, because of this uh, nature of uh, interacting uh, uh, systems that uh, we will uh, not be able to solve the problem simply by pursuing these uh, activities such as planting trees and all that. Uh, we, we won't be able to achieve sustainability because of that. So then uh, the question is, uh, uh, how do we actually achieve sustainability? So that answering that question is a little difficult. So let us take it step by step. I would uh, rather start off by uh, trying to answer um, or trying to look at the ways by which it cannot be achieved. The first uh, way it cannot be achieved is by greenwash. So greenwash is a term uh, where uh, used to describe a, a, a company or an organization which through essentially dishonest advertising or marketing claim to be green, claim to be sustainable. They, they, are, they are not doing anything sub substantial to improve their, uh, to reduce their environmental impacts. Uh, they, they, they will probably do something very, very insignificant and then claim to be a green company. So an example would be uh, maybe a petrochemical company. Uh, let us say it, it uh, applies a few uh, efficiency measures or maybe installs some pollution control equipment and uh, announces itself to be uh, an epitome of uh, a sustainable business. Uh, it is uh, far from that, uh, but uh, this is how things happen. They even change their logo uh, to something green or something that will kind of connect with our ideas of um, uh, what is sustainable. So uh, that is greenwash and that is not likely to uh, lead to sustainability. Uh, neither will mere compliance with regulations. The Pollution Control Board and the various regulatory agencies have got certain norms. Uh, but uh, merely by following them, it is not, uh, in fact many of those uh, regulations are far inadequate in terms of uh, what, we, what we actually need for sustainability. So uh, merely meeting them is, is, not, uh, is not going to uh, achieve our goal. Uh, e even at a personal level, you know, um, so there, are, uh, there are many people who say that, um, you know, uh, if everybody takes small steps, uh, you know, we can achieve sustainability before we know it. Uh, that is again not true because if you take, uh, if, if each person takes one small step, then humanity as a whole would have taken one small step. You could not have taken more than that. Uh, so. Uh, it is it's not, you know, these small steps are something like keep your car engine well tuned so that it does not pollute that much or uh, get your PUC certificate for your car uh, or something like uh, do not use polythene shopping bags, use cloth bags instead. So these are small steps which each of us can do and I am not saying they should not be done. They should be done. They, they, there is value in that. But do not don't imagine or do not delude yourself into thinking that, uh, you know, just by doing a, a bunch of these small superficial things that you have achieved sustainability. Uh, now uh, I, again uh, one thing is that the, uh, the race, uh, the mad race you know for economic growth is not going to uh, lead to sustainability either. Uh, the, uh, uh, some, some people subscribe to this idea of uh, you know uh, uh, remove poverty and then sustainability will follow. Yes poverty reduction should be done in any case but uh, it does not mean that simply by uh, economic growth you are going to uh, achieve sustainability because if we follow a consumerist uh, kind of approach then uh, the inequality in society probably cannot be um, addressed so the social problems are not going to vanish and by the time uh, the, the, all, the, all the poor people are well fed uh, the, the rich people would have consumed so many resources that there we would be on the verge of collapse. Now again this uh, re recall that diagram where I showed you the interactions, uh, solving one problem at a time might be impossible. I uh, will give you an example specifically the food crisis. If you, uh, if you are trying to solve the food crisis independently of the overpopulation problem or independently of the water problem then you will never succeed because uh, for instance uh, the um, about 87 percent of the water that we extract from all sources in India 
uh, about 87 percent of it goes for agriculture. So the water and the food problem are so closely linked uh, that you cannot imagine solving one without the other. So also with population. Um, again, there are there is there is no uh, there is no comprehensive view. There are different governmental agencies, NGOs, businesses, industries, each doing their good and honest bit. Uh, but unfortunately, if there is no uh, coordination between them, again, uh, it is very difficult. And in order to uh, um, in, in order to understand this last point, uh, I am going to give you an example. But before, before we go there, uh, I would just like to pose a question which you can uh, note down and um, keep thinking about it. As I, as I go through, uh, I, I will discuss it again towards the end. Uh, the, the question I am trying to uh, raise over here is that, is it possible that unsustainability uh, is a systemic problem since it affects all activities? Uh, in the context of food, in the con context of the economy, in the context of uh, uh, wildlife conservation, everywhere, okay, it, it encompasses everything. So, is it possible that it is a, a systemic activity? And uh, what, uh, what I actually mean by that is that, is it possible that all these problems that we see are mere symptoms of a deeper cause? So, is it likely that these, all the, the environmental and social problems that we see are mere symptoms of a much deeper, call it a root cause if you want. So I want you to ponder over it, I, I, I will be going ahead with my slides, but I want you to note this point and keep thinking about it as I, as I go further. Okay. So the, the last point uh, that I had uh, said which will not lead to sustainability was the fragmented approach where uh, governmental agencies and NGOs and all of them do their own thing. Uh, in order to understand that, this is an example, if you have several musicians with different musical instruments and they are all experts at what they do uh, and they all come and sit in one room and just simply do their thing, you are not likely to create an orchestra. No matter how experienced and how great experts all of them are uh, and the reason is that um, there is no coordination between them. The coordination is not likely to happen um, spontaneously. So unless they plan together, uh, they agree to play one composition, let us say, and there is somebody, some conductor who leads the group, who, who tells when the violinist should start playing and when the tabla person is going to start playing and all that. Um, it is not easy to uh, spontaneously have an orchestra. So, so something like this uh, may, may also uh, be true in the case of sustainable development. And how far are we on that path? Is there, is there an adequate consensus or understanding about sustainable development? Uh, because you now we have to take it to the context of different countries and within countries, different states, different political parties, different ideologies. So um, I do not think as of now there is an adequate consensus. Again, I, I leave it to your um, your own opinions, uh, but I do not think there is adequate consensus. Most people I think would agree in principle that we need sustainable development and that sustainable development is good and that it is positive and we should work towards it, but how much we should work towards it and in what way we should work towards it, I do not think there is that much of a consensus. Okay, but uh, nevertheless, there are, there are some interesting developments or there is some understanding that is evolving um, which I am going to, uh, some of those points I am going to share with you and uh, hopefully uh, you, will, you will appreciate them. So uh, again, there are, uh, I do not intend to cover each, each and every slide. Uh, there are, I have more slides than I will actually cover in detail because I want to leave the content with you. I want you to uh, read it through uh, at your leisure and maybe add some points uh, on your own when you teach your uh, classes. So I'm not going to cover all of e each and every slides. So um, uh, let's look at some of the uh, developments in our understanding about sustainability and how to achieve it. So the first point is that sustainability must be designed. Coming back to that orchestra example, uh, you, would, you would agree with me that uh, we need to design sustainability. There must be a deliberate design both at a component level as well as at the process level and I am going to explain this 
uh, a little more uh, later. So, this brings us to the uh, discussion of need the need for systems thinking. So, when you have these interconnected problems, you have uh, you have these interconnected systems, you you must get uh, a uh, an, an overall uh, view which will allow you to understand the whole whole problem and then solve it. So, uh, the systems thinking basically uh, uh, a good way to state uh, what systems thinking is, uh, is that the whole is more than the sum of individual parts. So, an example is all the parts of a car uh, do not make the car merely. So, if I, if I give you a, a truck load of uh, all the parts of your car, four wheels and uh, steering wheel and seats and all these things in random order, um, I cannot, uh, you, you will not agree that I have delivered a car at your home. So, uh, you want all those parts to be assembled in, in the proper order, only then does it uh, gain its function. So, it is the function that you are interested in and that is not possible merely by those components put in any, any possible or any random order. So, um, these various aspects that are there about uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the unsustainability, all those problems that we saw, we, we must put them all in perspective and then only we can solve the, um, the problem. So, I have a, a very nice uh, video over here. So, this video will explain to you what happens when you try to solve a problem uh, without uh, this understanding that uh, the, the that we are basically the biosphere is the is the entire system in which we are but small parts. So, when we do not have that understanding uh, uh, how trying to solve one problem actually ends up creating uh, some other problems. So, um, we are going to watch this uh, video where they uh, there is a uh, it, it is about uh, it is the uh, it is named cats in Borneo. So, how they uh, how in order to solve one problem the uh, more problems were created. My students find it very interesting. In fact, this video was suggested to be my, to me by one of my students. Okay, so um, using the the concepts of uh, systems thinking that we uh, just uh, uh, saw in in that video, if we um, we need to actually apply these to to solve the the unsustainability problem. Uh, let's let's look at it in in the context of uh, resource management. Uh, this is uh, another video which I uh, which I strongly recommend. Uh, the name of the video is uh, the story of stuff. This is a website and they have many other videos uh, also. Um, it is very interesting, but it takes about 21 minutes. So, I am not going to show it to you right now. You can watch it on your own. So, uh, this is a, a screenshot from that uh, video where uh, basically what you see on the left hand side is the uh, resources of the earth and uh, on the right hand side you see waste, uh, you know air, uh, air pollution and solid waste and everything. So, uh, what we are doing essentially is we are running a linear system whereby we are depleting resources which are on the left hand side and accumulating waste. Uh, and and uh, so, we have the industrial production, we have uh, distributions and retailers and then we have the consumer which is our homes uh, and uh, then we have waste. So, what they have shown here is an incinerator. So, uh, we are running a linear system and uh, it is obvious that uh, if we are running uh, a linear system like this, that resource depletion and waste accumulation on, on uh, either side uh, is going to lead to a uh, an ultimate collapse. So, uh, what, what actually we need for sustainability is a different paradigm. We need a, a, a cyclic or what is called as a closed loop system also uh, known as we need to close the loop. So, somehow or the other we need to extract resources from the earth, but only the renewable resources and cycle them through our um, industrial and distribution processes, consume it and release wastes which are easily compatible with uh, the biosphere. Uh, if there are any items that are not easily compatible with the biosphere, from 
our waste streams coming from our homes or point of consumption, they should be cycled back to our production processes. Things like lead for instance, you know you use uh, batteries, you use car batteries and the car batteries have lead. So uh, things like that should not be released to the environment, but should be taken back and put back into our uh, industrial pr production systems. So if, if we follow a, a scheme like this, then it is uh, possible to achieve um, uh, a, a sustainable management of our resources. So uh, another example that I'm giving over here, because it's all, always easy for us to imagine smaller systems and our home is probably the easiest to imagine. Again, similar to the previous slide, I have the resources which are the inputs to our house on the left hand side and the outputs which are the waste streams on the right hand side. So in the middle is our house. So our house actually acts uh, like a machine or a device that takes in nice, beautiful, clean resources from nature and in a linear fashion converts them into all sorts of wastes which um, end up cluttering up our streets, the solid waste, solid mixed waste, um, polluting our waters and spreading diseases. So uh, such, a, such a linear uh, use of resources is obviously not sustainable and we need to change that. Uh, I have, there is a lot more detail into this and I am not going to explain each and every detail. You can, you can see the, the diagrams on your own in your spare time, uh, but I am just giving you an overall idea. So what we really need is to kind of close the loop. So how do we close the loop? Some of the waste streams should be cycled back and converted into resources. So how do we make that happen? There are, there are various ways. You, you are already familiar with many of them. For instance, the, uh, the uh, liquid effluent can be taken through a biogas plant. It will yield some cooking gas. So it reduces your uh, input of um, uh, cooking fuel for the kitchen. You can also size it properly so that you don't need any other cooking fuel other than the biogas. And uh, then some of the food waste from the kitchen can probably go to a cow. The cow will return the, uh, the, the, uh, some of the waste uh, as a, an input for the biogas plant. You can have an organic garden where some scraps and other things can be put into the garden and uh, you can get organic produce. So what you see is in, if you actually take conscious efforts to cycle the loop, uh, to close the loop, uh, you, will, you will find that it becomes much more sustainable than before. Uh, so the only probably unavoidable uh, use of fuel is for uh, transportation where um, if you again are conscious and use more of public transportation, then your uh, ecological footprint is much smaller. Some, some unavoidable consumer products may still be required, but let's say the water, uh, water source can be made green by, uh, by having some rooftop rainwater harvesting and recharge of uh, groundwater, things like that. So there are many things that can be done. I have represented a few ideas only as, um, as examples. It doesn't mean that there are no other ideas or no better ideas. In fact, there could be many better ideas. Okay. So uh, now I showed you this for a small system. Uh, can we manage resources in a similar fashion for a larger system? Yes, it has been done. That is called as industrial symbiosis, where one company's waste becomes another company's treasure. So the waste stream of one uh, industry or one process can become the input or the resource for another process. So uh, there is a, a, a video, we will, we will watch uh, only a part of it and I will, I will cut it halfway through because uh, we have limited time, uh, but it's an interesting video. I just wanted to introduce you to the concept. Uh, there, is, there is more detail to it. It is um, a kind of uh, a systematic field of study and uh, Maybe it's, it cannot be covered in such a short time, but I just wanted to give you a, a, a flavor for it and how, how important it is. Uh, so this is again the, the Kalundberg um, uh, industrial symbiosis that, that they described in the video. Again, I'm going to skip the, the, the life cycle uh, analysis uh, for want of time.
So one of the points uh, that, that I think came up in that video was uh, that we need to design for the envi en environment. I mean, what's the point in first des uh, designing a, a product without taking into consider uh, consideration the environment and then worry about how it is going to, um, what its ultimate fate is going to be, you know, whether it has to be incinerated or uh, it's going to emit lead or mercury vapors and things like that. So uh, it is always better to, uh, to incorporate these ideas in the design process so that you can design things so that they can be reused or refurbished. Uh, disassembly, a planned disassembly can also be designed into the, um, the product. So uh, such steps are very important in, uh, so in other words, the, the, the company or the, uh, the manufacturer they, they cannot only focus on making the product and selling uh, uh, maximum amount of uh, units. Uh, they have to be concerned about what is the entire life cycle and how they can uh, minimize its impact on the environment. Okay. So this requires uh, some out of the box thinking for many of us and uh, such, in fact, in fact, in various areas, uh, you, can, you can come up with very innovative solutions if we have this kind of a perspective uh, in, in our mind. Um, I'm just going to uh, give you another uh, example of a system which is, uh, I think, very familiar to most of us. Uh, this is about what we do with our organic waste. So uh, commonly what happens in, in many places is that the food waste uh, along with garden waste or, or leaf cu uh, cuttings and things like that. It's all uh, mixed uh, together and put in the uh, municipal dumpster and along with the organic waste comes uh, a whole lot of other waste which is not um, organic. So everything goes in the municipal dumpster and then it gets uh, dumped in a, in a landfill and many of the landfills are not even well designed sanitary landfills, uh, but they are just simply dumped on some open land and then somebody, some well-meaning person um, probably lights it on fire and then the whole place um, is uh, like heavily polluted. So this is what commonly happens. So uh, all of us agree that's not the best thing to do. So we think that this is something better. So we, we can think of a, a, a simple sustainable system where the, the organic waste is separated from the other st uh, waste streams and it is put in, the, in a composter and you get some compost and what do you do with the compost? It's good for agriculture, so you can produce some food out of it. So um, you are not only getting uh, or, or solving the solid waste problem partly, but you are also uh, kind of reducing the, the food problem. So you're making some new food. Okay, so that is, that is good and uh, you are, uh, I mean, instead of a liability, you know, now you have assets, you know, you have, you have foods, uh, you, you have food production, so that's good. Uh, but what I, what I want to uh, propose is that that's not uh, the best you can do. Uh, if you apply your mind, you can do something even better. Uh, so uh, it, it, only, the, only the system gets a little complicated. So I uh, just, uh, just follow me with this. Uh, let us say the food waste uh, is collected before it rots. So uh, let us say vegetable peels and uh, you know leftovers from fruits and things like that. They are pretty, they are some, at least part of it is cattle edible. If that is fed to a cow, uh, the cow um, is a bioreactor which within roughly 18 hours or so will convert that waste into milk. So you got milk out of that. And uh, it also provides urine, which has great agricultural value. Uh, many of you might have heard uh, these concoctions like panchagavya and things like that, which, um, which have very good results for agriculture. And of course, it yields dung. And the dung can go into a biogas plant. To the biogas plant, you can add the food waste that is not cattle edible. You can also add garden waste to it. And you can get biogas out of it. Now, not only do you get energy, the biogas, but you also get a waste uh, slurry and that slurry can again go for agriculture. So you are not essentially the, the agriculture in, in the previous system, you, you directly added all the organic waste to make compost. So you are not taking a major hit because some of the slurry, the slurry is still 
I, I, I agree that a lot of carbon actually goes in the methane, but uh, some of it is uh, some of the organic carbon is still there in the slurry. So you can potentially if, if designed properly, particularly if the cow urine is uh, made into a very good uh, bio fertilizer, liquid fertilizer, then you can get very high food yields. Uh, so yeah, the, the compared to the previous system, not only did you get milk, uh, but you got food and you also got some energy and then obviously you can uh, let your imagination run wild and maybe put in a, a pyrolyzer if energy is of greater importance then you can take part of the garden waste and put it in a pyrolyzer. The biochar that comes from a pyrolyzer is actually uh, a, a good uh, agricultural, uh, it is a soil amendment. Uh, it, it Basically it has a lot of, it is a high surface area carbon uh, so you, uh, microbes can breed uh, in, in it and it, it can boost agricultural productivity. So uh, I, I agree that it becomes, uh, this is just a hypothetical example of, of how uh, one commonly known system can be improved and refined uh, by including more and more components. It does not mean that, uh, I mean each one would have to be scientifically evaluated whether it actually works and to uh, what is the benefit, uh, but this is uh, just a, an instructive kind of example. Okay, so uh, you know this compares these three where in the first case you were, the food waste was uh, land filled leading to a net loss, contamination of groundwater, breeding of vectors and all that. In the second example you got profits by selling the compost or doing some agriculture with the compost. In the third case you can get greater profits because you not only get uh, food uh, but you also get uh, other outputs such as uh, the biogas and things like that. Okay. So uh, if we actually want to design such systems uh, to manage our resources, particularly the organic resources, you have to identify some organisms which may be plants or animals uh, that consume our waste streams, the organic waste streams and who themselves are, are robust and require minimal care and they, they yield something of, of high value. So if we, if we strike a partnership with nature, uh, then nature has got so, such wonderful organisms which can actually help us convert uh, a, some, uh, a process which is leading to a loss into something which can make uh, great profits for us. Okay, now uh, it is time for the break. I just want to play the devil's advocate once again and say that. Uh, this is not the whole story. We saw how resource, we can through integrated resource management uh, or, or rather sustainability requires integrated resource management, but that I am saying that it is not the whole story because many other green technologies and many other things are going to be required um, and not only technology, there are, there are other areas in which similar development, complementary development has to happen in the same direction. Uh, uh, just as an example, I want to say that even the best technology will, will not succeed if governmental policies are adverse or if it does not make good business. So uh, these things also have to be factored. I, I want you to, uh, in the break, I want you to just think about uh, maybe a list of what you think would be a sufficient set of conditions, necessary and sufficient set of conditions for sustainability. So I want you to do that uh, exercise in the break.